Hi micro folks. Today is Wednesday, March 18th, 2020. We are starting the videos for lecture exam three. So just to get you oriented, um, this is our microbial genetics PowerPoint two. Um, the last bit of information that will be on our lecture exam two, which will be next Monday and Tuesday, um, we will include information on the LAC operon, on antibiotic resistant inducible operons, and on um, virulence factors such as exotoxin operons that can be induced. So that will be the end of lecture exam two information. So we're going to start next on slide two. This is um, mutations. This is the start of information for lecture exam three. So let's see if I can't get this to go full screen. Hopefully. Good. Okay. So folks, mutations. Um, mutations would be described as a change in the genetic information of a cell or a virus. So because all cells use DNA as their genetic information, a change in the DNA base sequence would be considered a mutation. Um, with viruses, it depends on if we're talking about a DNA virus. So in a DNA virus, um, for example, for example, the herpes simplex viruses, since they use DNA, a mutation would be a change in the DNA base sequence um, for a DNA virus. But in contrast, folks, for RNA viruses, such as the coronavirus, is that are causing problems right now, um, influenza virus, HIV, they all use RNA as their genetic information. So for the RNA viruses, a change in the RNA base sequence would be a mutation. So let's um, just think about spontaneous mutation rates. These are the mistakes that are made when um, genetic information is copied. So the spontaneous mutation rates in general for all cells would be the um, mistake rate that DNA polymerase um, makes following editing or proofreading. And you'll recall folks that we said that after proofreading or editing DNA polymerase has a mistake rate of one mistake in every maybe 10 to the ninth nucleotides or we could say one um, incorrect nucleotide or one mutation in every 10 to the ninth nucleotides is approximate, right? Um, likewise, we would predict that DNA viruses would have the same spontaneous mutation rate, one wrong nucleotide or one um, mistake or one mutation in every 10 to the ninth nucleotide. So that's a pretty low spontaneous mutation rate. In contrast, folks, remember um, RNA viruses have RNAs, their genetic information, so they have to use RNA polymerases to copy their genetic information. And you'll recall, since RNA polymerases can't proofread, they have a much higher um, mistake rate, mutation rate. So in RNA viruses, we would expect a spontaneous mutation rate of one wrong nucleotide or one um, mistake or one mutation in every 10 to the fifth nucleotide. So that's a much, much higher mutation rate. And we'll come back to this, you guys, when we talk about the coronavirus, um, influenza viruses, and HIV. These high mutation rates really make it very difficult for us humans. Okay. So folks, this will be pretty superficial, just kind of highlights, mostly vocabulary. <clears throat> so we can have different types of mutations, mistakes that are made. The most common um, mutations are what are called uh, point mutations or base substitutions. This is when, the, for example, the DNA is being copied, um, perhaps a um, nucleotide carrying a thymine is introduced when in fact it should have been a nucleotide carrying, say, a guanine. <clears throat> so if the mutation just causes a single base um, change, we can have three results. And we want to thank you guys if, it's, if there's a a base change in the DNA, it's going to be transcribed into um, mRNA, and that will also carry the mutation. And then that mutant mRNA is going to be translated by the ribosomes. So we can see there will be three, three results. Um, you'll recall that we said the genetic code was degenerate. Um, you might remember, you guys, there, could, there can be up to like six different mRNA codons that will be translated into the same amino acid. 
So it's possible the result of a point mutation would be what we call a silent mutation, meaning that there will be no change in the amino acid sequence um, as a result of that mutation. Right? And again, this is because the, you'll recall the ge genetic code is degenerate, and we said that's going to help protect against harmful effects of mutations. Now, a second uh, consequence might be that the mutation causes a change in the amino acid sequence of the mutant protein. And what we mean by missense is, let's say, in the normal, what we call wild-type protein, maybe there should have been an alanine at a specific um, uh, position in the protein. But with the mutation, now instead of having an alanine, maybe we'll introduce a glycine instead. And that's, cause a, and that's called a missense mutation. And the, um, the consequences of missense mutations, it depends. It depends on um, what is the new um, amino acid that's being introduced. Um, if, if the original amino acid, say, was hydrophilic and the new amino acid is hydrophobic, that might have a huge impact on how the mutant protein folds, and so we would expect maybe there would be a big impact on functional conformation. But if, um, let's say, the original amino acid was hydrophilic and the new amino acid, the result of the mutation, is also hydrophilic, perhaps that won't have a big change in how the protein folds, right? Maybe it won't have an impact on the functional conformation, right? And it probably also depends on where the um, new amino acid is introduced. Is it like maybe um, close to the very start of the protein at the very end? So the position of the new amino acid might make a difference on how the protein folds and thus um, how it would impact functional conformation. And then folks, the last possible result of point mutations is um, that the, the mutation results in a stop codon in mRNA, where instead there should have been a sense codon uh, a codon that would be translated into amino acid. With the mutation, now you have a stop codon, and so protein synthesis would stop um, when the ribosome hits that stop codon, right, on the mutant mRNA. And such mutations are called nonsense mutations, right? And again, this might, it might, um, the consequence might depend on where this nonsense mutation occurs. If it starts right at the very beginning of the coding sequence, right, you might only have, oh my goodness, maybe like a little protein fragment of maybe, we'll say, 10 amino acids. So obviously um, that mutant protein can't fold into any kind of functional conformation. But in contrast, folks, what if we had a, non a nonsense mutation um, with a, a stop codon introduced maybe at the very tail end of the coding sequence of the protein? So maybe the mutant protein is only missing maybe one or two amino acids at the end. Perhaps that wouldn't have a big impact on the um, functional conformation. So, so again, these point mutations, we, we, we would have to see exactly where the point mutation is occurring, um, what kind of amino acid uh, sequence changes we see before we could predict what's going to happen to the functional conformation of the mutant protein. So very often, folks, we think of mutations as being bad, right, because we think that um, a mutation will result in a change in the amino acid sequence that um, would be harmful for the cell, maybe a mutant protein that can't function. But we also want to remember, folks, that sometimes through these point mutations, like through missense mutations, um, we might have mutant proteins that fold into a new functional conformation. The mutant protein now can carry out a new function for the cell. And who knows, maybe that function would be helpful. It's possible that it was through mutations that a bacteria have evolved their antibiotic resistance genes. And, and certainly um, the evolution of those antibiotic resistance genes has been really helpful to the bacteria, especially living in environments um, where lots and lots of antibiotics are used. Okay, so mostly vocabulary here, folks, to learn. Now, in contrast to point mutations, this next, this next one, you guys, if I ask you what's the most devastating, the most harmful type of mutation, you'd want to tell me frame shift mutations. And frame shift mutations are going to result if we have an insertion or a deletion um, of nucleotides, not in um, packets of three. Because if, for example, if we insert 
one new nucleotide, say, into our DNA, or if we delete, for example, one new nucleotide in our mutant DNA, that changes what we call the reading frame. And as a result, following the insertion or deletion, uh, following the frame shift mutation, usually the amino acid sequence of the resulting mutant protein is totally changed. And usually this ends up with a worthless um, uh, mutant protein, a uh, protein that can't function at all. So um, we have a slide on frame shift mutations, folks. It's a, a little bit challenging to describe. This would be better if we are doing it on the board, but we'll, we'll do our best. And folks, let me just, uh, a, last, um, a last term here. Um, mutagens. So mutagens um, is anything, a physical factor, a chemical that increases mutation rates above the spontaneous mutation rate. Okay, all right, so let's check out the slide on frame shift mutations. All right, folks, so again, a little bit complicated here, but here is our so-called wild type DNA. This would be from our cell. This is the DNA sequence. Um, here's how it would be transcribed into mRNA. And here, folks, we see the reading frame. And one of the significance of the, um, the first AUG, the start codon, is it establishes what the reading frame will be. So here's our first AUG, okay, translated into methionine. This is the second um, codon. AAG will be um, translated into lysine. Here's our third codon, translated into phenylalanine. And here's our fourth codon, translated into glycine. Well, let's go up here, okay, and let's try to keep our eyes on this triplet of um, adenines right there. Okay, so you guys, so there's a triplet, three adenines there. Now let's go over here to the DNA and let's cause a deletion of one of those adenines. Okay, so now let's look at how the reading frame is going to be altered once we, once we transcribe that mutant DNA into mRNA, we're going to see the reading frame is going to change what we call downstream to the three prime end. So here, here, here we go again, you guys. Um, we're okay up here. This is the DNA transcribed into AUG. So that's our start code on methionine. Here's a, um, the second um, DNA that's going to be transcribed into AAG, the second, the second code on. And so far we're okay. It's just like the, the original over here. But right here, I do believe you guys, yeah, right here where before we had um, C-A-A-A, -A -A, okay, we still have our, wait a minute, how did I screw that up, you guys, okay, A-U-G, A-A-G, oh, sorry, so let's see here, right, 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 sorry, you guys, me bad, first codon, second codon, this would have been our third codon right here. And folks, if we compare it to the wild type, see the third codon in the wild type, the normal cell would have been UUU, right? But because of that deletion of one nucleotide carrying one of the, the um, adenines, instead of an mRNA codon UUU, we've got, we've got the codon UUG, right? And UUG encodes information for a totally different amino acid leucine, right? And over here, the original third codon would have been um, translated into, into phenylalanine, okay? So now, everything downstream towards the, oops, sorry, through, um, towards the three prime end of our um, protein, all the amino acids are going to be changed. So this is really devastating. Usually that just totally changes the shape that the mutant protein is going to fold into. And in addition, folks, usually you end up with what we call a premature stop codon. So we have a, a new stop codon introduced because the reading frame has been changed. So we'll end up with a totally different amino acid sequence and probably a premature stop codon. So usually following a frame shift, usually the mutant protein is just worthless, right? So frame shift mutations, folks, um, they can be caused by, there's a lot, a lot of, um, uh, mutagens, carcinogens, and tobacco smoke. If you do a search on it, there's a number of different um, toxins within tobacco smoke, and some of them can cause these frame shift mutations. That's probably why people that smoke a lot are at increased risk for lung cancer later in life. Aflatoxin, folks, this is fascinating. This is a toxin made um, by specific 
um, species of the fungal molds called Aspergillus. And this is one of the many mycotoxins that fungi can make. And aflatoxin can cause frame shift mutations in the liver. And this is why we're so worried about aflatoxin because it can increase, if we consume it, it can increase our risk of liver cancer. So often these mutagens end up being carcinogens. And where we would um, consume the aflatoxin is the um, aspergillus likes to grow on moldy peanuts. And so moldy peanuts are the classic source of aflatoxin. So that's why we don't want to eat moldy peanuts. Um, the concern is if you have unethical peanut farmers or peanut producers, they might take their moldy peanuts and grind it, grind it up to make peanut butter, right? So you can tell that they were moldy. So we're always worried about um, um, peanut butter made by unethical people that might have aflatoxin in it. And of course, who eats a lot of peanut butter are kids, right? So they, they, um, the government does um, sample and surveys, you know, analyzes um, the peanut butter to make sure there isn't any aflatoxin present. This is just an example, folks, of where a frame shift mutation um, doesn't cause harm to the bacterium. This is a, um, a mutant bacterium but where it can increase the virulence of the bacterium. And so consequently, if the bacteria invade us, it could cause more harm. So this is, um, this is a mutant strain of Clostridium difficile. And those of you working in the medical fields, it's often nicknamed C. diff. So we know you guys, Clostridium, they're obligate or strict anaerobes, but they make endospores. So the endospores can survive in aerobic environments. Now, Clostridium difficile, um, previously it was associated with hospital-acquired infections. So in old days we'd call them nosocomial infections, an infection you acquire in a hospital or nursing home. Um, and usually they were associated with people that had received broad-spectrum antibiotics, killing all their good competitive um, bacteria in the intestinal tract. And broad-spectrum antibiotics won't destroy endospores. So the idea is you give your patient broad spectrum antibiotics, you wipe out all the good competing bacteria in the intestinal tract, and then if the person, maybe they're in a nursing home or in a hospital, um, they end up swallowing an endospore, because these endospores, you guys, are just in the environment, they're in dust, they're on hard surfaces. Um, if the patient then swallowed a Clostridium, Clostridium difficile endospore, or maybe they already had um, Clostridium difficile, maybe they were already infected with it at low numbers, um, so if the endospore germinates in the intestine or the Clostridium difficile survive antibiotic therapy, they start growing like crazy. And um, when they get into late log stationary phase, they start producing a toxin. And the toxin causes this inflammatory response in the intestine. It's kind of like the diphtheria pseudomembrane in the back of the throat. C. diff causes like a pseudomembrane uh, formation in the colon. So they call this a pseudomembranous colitis. It causes um, diarrhea, which can be really hard on your compromised um, patients, right? What if they're el you know, elderly folks, maybe recovering from surgery? And in severe cases, um, the toxin helps the cl Clostridium difficile actually penetrate, perforate the intestine. And then you definitely have a life-threatening um, peritonitis going on. Well, why are we talking about Clostridium difficile and frame shift mutations? Well, it turns out that normally the toxin isn't made until the clostridium hit late log or the stationary phase of growth. And it's a repressor protein binding to, a, or a repressor-like protein, sorry, that binds to um, an operator that blocks um, transcription of the toxin gene until late log or, um, or early stationary. But in this community acquired, this is really frightening, guys. This is something we get in the community. And this um, hypervirulent, community acquired mutant strain of Clostridium difficile, there was a frame shift mutation in the gene for that repressor-like protein. So now in this hypervirulent strain, you know, it causes extra damage. The toxin is made continually, you know, all through um, log or exponential phase into stationary phase. So we get lots and lots of toxin produced and therefore um, in the patients, this strain is going to be more rapidly, potentially fatal, right? if we end up with that um, perforation of the intestinal tract. So um, in this case, the frame shift mutation causes an increase in 
toxin production increase um, damage. And again, this is really scary, you guys, because this is this can be epidemic. We can have little local um, outbreaks of of um, C diff. Um, and again, acquired in the community. So just tying this in, folks, with um, lab chapter 14 microbial. Um, excuse me, chapter 14 is controlling microbial growth um, and tying it in, folks, this is actually kind of cool um, with um, the, the next slides on UV irradiation and that's one of our lab experiments. Um, what they now have in hospitals are these little UV robots and what they'll do is the UV, UV robot will shine UV light in a patient's room. So it's really important everybody is out of the room, right? Because we know UV can damage skin, it can damage our eyes and cause skin cancer but they'll send the robots into the rooms they'll open all the drawers try to get as much surface area where any clostridium difficile endospores might be and let the robot irradiate the room and I don't know times you guys I think the longer the better especially if you're trying to dis destroy endospores so right now you guys I'm gonna make an intelligent guess of maybe like 30 minutes to an hour to make sure you killed all the clostridium difficile endospores um, and that has, that has really helped decrease the number of C. diff epidemics in hospitals. Um, the one thing we do want to remember, UV doesn't penetrate very well, so you're only going to be destroying endospores on surfaces, right? So just a general good cleaning is so important. Okay, we keep going here. So folks, this is the um, lab experiment we're going to do. This is how those UV robots are going to help destroy um, the endospores in, in um, any other um, cellular organisms, and certainly I would think viruses as well. Um, although I'm not sure if UV is going to work on viral RNA. That might be something cool for us to check out. Okay, okay, so um, so the background here, and in, in I'll describe our lab experiment. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, swab surfaces of plates with our bacteria, and then we're going to irradiate our bacteria for different um, uh, amounts of time. So, for example, one minute and four minutes. And we're going to use short wavelength UV. And by short wavelength, I mean a wavelength of around 254 to 260 nanometers. And it's, it's at that short wavelength that DNA absorbs a lot of the energy from the UV radiation. And the energy that's absorbed triggers the electrons to rearrange. And what we'll end up with is, is what's called a thymine dimer. This is abnormal. This is damaged DNA. And a thymine dimer is when two neighboring thymines on the same strand, their electrons get rearranged. They break the hydrogen bonds with the complementary adenines on the opposite DNA strand. And instead, they form a covalent bond between them. So the covalent bond between two neighboring thymines is a thymine dimer. Now, this is abnormal. This is damaged DNA. Um, it will cause a roadblock when DNA polymerase comes along. It won't be able to um, to uh, copy that damaged piece of DNA. So you're going to stop um, DNA replication. You'll start chromos you'll stop chromosome replication, so the bacteria can no longer um, divide. And furthermore, we're going to stop RNA polymerase, so the DNA can't be transcribed, and thus indirectly you're shutting down protein synthesis. Now, since UV is um, found in sunlight, right? Cells have evolved repair mechanisms. So in bacteria, um, we have two repair me mechanisms. One is called light repair, and it's called light repair because you need uh, visible light to activate this protective enzyme within the cell called photolyase. And what photolyase does, it comes along, it's like a pair of scissors, it just cuts that covalent bond and that permits the two thymines to reform the correct hydrogen bonds with the complementary adenines on the other strand. So that's pretty cool. But then um, a second repair mechanism has evolved. This is called dark repair because it doesn't require visible light. Um, um, but probably a more descriptive term is excision repair. And this involves a number of proteins and enzymes. So um, in excision repair, proteins and enzymes recognize this damaged piece of DNA and what will happen is we'll have enzymes that will cut out that damaged piece of DNA, remove it, okay so here's the damaged piece of DNA that's being removed and then DNA polymerase 1 will come along and synthesize new undamaged DNA using the opposite strand as a template, right, so here's DNA 
polymerase replacing that excised cut out piece of DNA, when it runs into the DNA in front of it, who's going to take over? That'll be ligase, right? So we'll end up with ligase sealing the new end of the DNA to the, um, the end of the old existing strand of DNA. So that's called excision repair. Now the problem is, folks, we know even DNA polymerases make mistakes. So if you have a lot of excision repair going on, you would predict you're going to increase your mutation rate, right? So that could be a problem for the cell. In our UV irradiation experiment, you guys, we're going to be introducing so many thymine dimers here, right, that the cell can't repair them. And what, what we'll see, and I just checked the plates this morning, that even after one minute of irradiation, um, our bacteria, um, it almost wiped them all out. So we'll do a follow-up video so you can see the results of the UV irradiation experiment that we did in, um, in lab. But again, you guys, a powerful way to control um, to control, inhibit, kill bacteria using UV light. But again, folks, be really careful because the UV will cause the same damage in our skin cells, right? And um, as a result of lots of uh, UV exposure, say if, if you love to sunbathe as little kids, we would always welcome summer by going out and getting like a third degree sunburn. I mean, we just love the sun. But as a result, you can have mutations, right, from so much repair that then you can in, end up with an increased risk for skin cancer. And and again, you guys, I know I, I shared too much with you, but in the last, what, three years, I've had two, um, what they call Mohs surgery, to remove skin cancer. And it was because as kids, we just, you know, in the summertime, we were always out in the sun. So the skin cancers, um, like the first one I had was basal cell. The last one I just had was squamous cell. And I'm hoping I won't get the third one, melanoma. But again, folks, we should try to be really careful about not exposing ourselves to too much sunlight because of the UV exposure and increased risk for um, mutations that might increase our risk for skin cancer. I think, oh, wait a minute. The next slide, you guys, I'm, I just repeated what... I just narrated, so we'll just go through it. So UV radiation is a mutagen, you guys. Um, if I ask you what kind of damage is short wavelength UV cause, you want to tell me thymine dimers, and the consequence is DNA replication and transcription is blocked. The two repair mechanisms, light repair, we, uh, visible light activates the enzyme photolyase, which will break or hydro hydrolyze the covalent bond within the thymine dimer, so the two thymines now can form the correct hydrogen bonds with the complementary adenines on the opposite strand. Dark repair, or also known as excision repair, we're going to cut out the section of DNA with thymine dimer. So to cut out means to excise it, to cut it out. DNA polymerase 1 replaces the cut out uh, DNA with new undamaged DNA, and then ligase forms a covalent bond between the new and the old DNA. And again, folks, the more um, excision repair is going on, the more chance for mutations, right? So in any cell where there's a lot of, um, maybe a lot of damage, or for whatever reason the cells are having to, to uh, replicate, we want to remember there's always that background mutation rate, um, even with DNA polymerase, right? One mutation in every 10 to the 9th nucleotides. So cells that are having to replicate um, abnormally high, we would, we would, think there might be an increased risk for mutations. Um, and um, so we said this could increase the risk, for example, for um, mutations in humans with skin cancer. Um, if we have a chance to talk about the hepatitis B or hepatitis C viruses, um, one reason they might increase our risk for liver cancer, they invade our liver cells and replicate and kill liver cells, is that we're asking our liver cells to replicate much more frequently and again, that might um, increase our risk for introducing mutations that might lead to liver cancer. Okay, and this is just the, the um, kinds of skin cancer that might result um, if, you, if we have excess exposure to UV light. And I think this is it. Right. Okay, folks, so we're going to end that mutations um, video. And remember, folks, this is the first topic that will be on our lecture exam three. The next video will be, this is a fun topic, you guys, it's on um, horizontal gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer is how a bacterium, we'll call it the donor bacterium, can transfer um, genes, DNA, to a neighbor, we'll call the recipient. So this is something you and I can't do, so it's kind of, kind of fun. All right, folks, so we'll end this here, and then we'll do the next video on horizontal gene transfer. Let's see if I can get this little guy to stop.